Now we will continue with the second part of the dermatological condition and um, we will start with uh, contact dermatitis. Contact dermatitis is an acute inflammation of the skin. Uh, by irritants or allergen, if you would um, be able to appreciate in this picture, um, most of the time uh, contact dermatitis um, reveals the prior exposure of the allergen uh, has or mimics or um, has the same form of the prior um, irritant that was in contact with the skin. Most of the time it's symmetric, it's bilateral. If you are able to see this patient had orthopedic braces and uh, you're able to distinguish exactly what was before uh, in contact with the skin that irritated that skin. Uh, most likely this is uh, a prior piercing or um, possibly a tattoo or um, not sure that this uh, um, levedula or butterfly uh, form uh, is, is basically revealing that this object was priorly present in contact, in direct contact with the skin, the same as this earring that produced an allergen, uh, a reaction, a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to the earlobe. The skin changes range uh, from erythema to blistering and even to ulcer ulceration. Um, you could uh, as I said, able to appreciate what was exposed in the skin surface. So again, it's uh, an acute um, or chronic because if you do not discontinue the allergen, um, the process continues, the inflammatory process continues and it becomes chronic up to the formation of granulomas and scarring. Um, of these reactions are always uh, related to substance that were in contact with the skin. For example, if you put a pair of glove um, and you are allergic to um, latex, for example, or you're allergic to vinyl, uh, or you're allergic to the powder that is inside the uh, uh, glove, you're going to have uh, both hands, because remember, it's most of the time, uh, symmetric, bilateral, uh, or of course if you if it's only an object that was in contact with the skin you're not going to have it in both hands uh, if it's for example only um, a ring um, if you're wedding ring for example or any uh, ring that is not uh, gold and you're allergic to titanium or you're allergic to silver it's not going to be bilateral symmetric it's going to be unilateral but if it's unilateral, you will be able to distinguish that um, the form um, of that particular object that was in contact with the skin prior. It could be um, related to chemicals such as kerosene uh, or, for example, if you um, now uh, go to the sun and uh, you're in the beach or uh, in the boat and you decide to drink lemonade or um, you were uh, putting lime uh, or lemon uh, on some food or fishes or something, uh, the uh, contact of the lime uh, or the lemon uh, juice with the sun could produce a photodermatitis and this is uh, a contact dermatitis as well. The pathophysiology again is uh, caused by irritants or allergen and this is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. It could be irritants uh, such as chemicals, acids, uh, met metals, uh, alkalines, uh, it could be soaps. Um, we as nurses uh, wash our hands every day and sometimes the foam or the liquid that is inside the rooms to um, clean our hands as an antiseptic substance could be also uh, abrasive. Um, plants, uh, it could be related to pepper, it could be poison IV um, or any body fluids that are in contact and could produce an irritant reaction to your skin. Uh, it could be environmental, 
it could be related to high friction to high temperature um, but again it is an immunological uh, sensitization uh, an allergic reaction um, it's toxic um, in nature and uh, it has a direct cytotoxic uh, damage to the keratoid keratinocytes which are the uh, epidermal cells so um, it is a reaction to the skin by contact with the allergen as I explained and uh, it is a cell mediated reaction if it's an acute episode it's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction if it's chronic in nature and you do not discontinue the allergen uh, it becomes a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction uh, mediated by T lymphocytes which is delay hypersensitivity again it's an immunological reaction that uh, involves the skin and the uh, uh, keratinocytes which are the epidermal cells um, in addition to uh, contact dermatitis um, patients uh, could have uh, what's called eczema and eczema is no more than um, basically an atopic dermatitis and atopic dermatitis is very common in patients that uh, have um, asthma, uh, uh, heno fever um, as family history for example if um, you have rhinosinusitis um, asthma as personal history or um, as family history you could develop atopic dermatitis very very common in pediatric population and it has a very uh, distinct uh, pattern uh, distribution as you would see now in the pictures it is non-contagious as an inflammatory condition it has relapsing and um, remitting uh, in nature basically the pathophysiology of both is uh, as I said before is an immunological reaction type 1 uh, versus type 4 if it's chronic there's damage of the uh, lipid bilayer of the skin that uh, produces edema produces capillary permeability produces uh, vasodilation um, that again at the end could produce uh, uh, blistering, uh, erythema, uh, worm, uh, heat of the skin and of course uh, edema as you could see uh, something was in contact it could be a dressing it could be for example the iodine that was given to the patient prior surgery um, it could be anything that uh, was in contact uh, with that uh, patient's skin the clinical manifestations uh, as I said uh, because of um, the damage that is produced uh, in the uh, keratinocytes as I said due to the inflammatory reaction uh, of the lipid bilayer the patients would have uh, papules uh, vesicles blisters and again it's usually confined to the area of exposure of that particular allergen you will be able to see you will be able to trace what was there before if it's addressing you are able to see the the tape uh, the uh, form if it was square if it was rectangular um, etc remember that the main pathophysiology you can't forget because it's very important we tend to go back in questions is the, if it's acute is type 1 hypersensitivity reaction and it's IgE mediated um, however if this is the, uh, related to chronic conditions um, the disease process goes through uh, different phases uh, there is gene encoding there is the, um, differentiation of keratinocytes there is uh, transepidermal uh, water loss um, 
due to type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. In the acute phase that could last uh, one day, uh, a week, or even up to two months, there is redness, there is weeping, there is crusting, uh, there is blistering, uh, papules, uh, vesicles. Uh, it could be really, I mean, it's basically on the area that the allergen were exposed. In the chronic phase, um, patients would have uh, scratching, maybe not the redness itself. Uh, patient will be having liquid, liquid Lichenification, if you go back to pathophysiology, lichenification is um, basically the damage that is produced by scratching. You're able to see the uh, anatomy of the um, epidermis because there is engorgement um, of the uh, follicles and uh, the keratinocytes. Could be papules and 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 uh, macules as well, but it's most likely uh, related to already uh, scarring formation. Dry scales um, is also a present. This is again the uh, path of physiology that I already went through it. This is an example if you're able to see uh, this is healthy tissue and right here because the patient had um, a prior uh, trauma or laceration that received uh, uh, suturing, most likely this patient had a dressing in the whole arm, uh, forearm and hand. So you're able to trace down that this in this particular area, uh, patient had something uh, that was exposed to it. You're able to see erythema, you're able to see vesicles, these tiny shiny uh, lesions or vesicles, you're able to see blisters or bullas. And of course, this is very pruritiginous, which is no more than um, uh, itching. Again, as I explained already, this is the, the phases that go from acute up to chronic. In the acute, you were able to see uh, well demarcated erythema and edema because remember you have vasodilation, capillary permeability, uh, and edema. Uh, you see vesicles and papules. Uh, in the subacute, um, there is mild erythema, so the erythema is, tends to go uh, or fade off or go away with um, papules and uh, uh, macules as well, but uh, appears more uh, dry. Uh, skin and uh, it tends to appear the scaling already, uh, which is the uh, damaged uh, dead skin. Um, in the chronic, uh, basically what you see is uh, the deepening of the skin, the uh, appearance of all the anatomy of the epidermis uh, due to uh, lichenification, um, small firm round papules, uh, which is no more than uh, nodules and, and, and scarring, excoriations um, due to scratching. And hypo or hyperpigmentation, depending how deep the damage went. This is again the pathophysiology uh, in contact dermatitis, uh, doesn't have any relationship with the prior uh, history, personal or family history of uh, um, allergies or ato atopia, uh, such as asthma, such as uh, heno fever, such as rhinosinusitis, but in atopic dermatitis, it is genetically related. Uh, these patients, if they themselves are not, um, uh, have an allergy uh, nature, such as asthma, heno fever, rhinosinusitis, the family history uh, has the tendency to, so they transmit the genetic information to the offsprings. And uh, one way of manifesting the asthma or the allergy is by atopia, such as atopic dermatitis. So exactly the same presentation, but the location of the area is typical. Again, it's very, very common in pediatric population and you're will be able to see it in the anti-cubital area, popliteal falsa, the neck, the wrist, the ankles, the face, the eyelids, the scalp, 
and behind the ears. I mean, the reason you have to go through it is because sometimes adolescents tend to have this, but it's more commonly in pediatric population. The uh, uh, treatment uh, is based on um, restoration of normal epidermal layer uh, and avoid complications. Uh, remember that through scratching, uh, any damage uh, uh, or entrance or break of the um, innative uh, immune system, which is the skin barrier, by scratching could provoke secondary bacterial infections with uh, staphylococci and streptococci, uh, infections that we already have uh, covered, which is cellulitis, for example. Um, diagnosis uh, is basically by clinical evaluation, sometimes testing for allergy triggers, such as uh, skin prick uh, testing uh, or patch testing uh, is necessary, for example, in patients that have uh, atopic dermatitis. <clears throat> Um, atopic dermatitis is often hard to differentiate from other dermatosis, for example, the contact dermatitis or uh, seborrheic dermatitis or even psoriasis, unless they have the typical uh, silver uh, plaques. And remember, you cannot forget that uh, atopic dermatitis has a family history of atopia or personal history themselves. And the distributions of the lesions are very helpful to differentiate that we already cover them. And it's right here, it's very important for you to know this. The anticubital, the popliteal falls at the neck, the wrist, the ankles, the face. The, most of the time, uh, even though it's, it seems to be very, very uh, uh, general or, or, or broad, the, uh, lo where it's localized, if you see them in the anticubital area and popliteal uh, fossa, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to miss. The main differential diagnosis, for example, is that the psoriasis, of course, they do have the silver plaque, but if they don't, uh, it's usually uh, located in the extensor uh, rather than flexure. Uh, Atopic dermatitis is most of the time located in the flexure areas. Anticubital, when you flex your arm, that's the anticubital. When you flex your knee, that's the popliteal fossa. And the psoriasis is, is mostly the extensors, the knees, the, the elbows. In seborrheic dermatitis, uh, most of the time is in the nasolabial faults. <clears throat> in the glabellar, which is the area between your eyes, the scalp, that that is not an area for uh, atopic dermatitis. Okay. So going back to the treatment again, uh, supportive care with uh, moisturizers and dressings, antihistamines for providers. Avoid the precipitant factors because that's the main part. If you continue using the same allergen or irritant, it's going to continue the same damage of the skin. Sometimes immunomodulators are helpful and ultraviolet light as well. You need to hydrate uh, the skin with water, uh, treat the inflammation, uh, promote comfort uh, for itching, cool compresses, uh, colloid, uh, oatmeal bath, uh, boro solution as well. Use soap substitutes uh, rather than regular soap. Of course, if this regular uh, soap or soap substitutes is the actual irritant. I remember when I, when the um, regular soap was uh, changed in uh, the hospitals, uh, I developed uh, um, contact dermatitis in my both hands by the foam. So I was allergic to that um, substitute. Apply emollients. Uh, you need to cover the skin very well with uh, moisturizers. Uh, sometimes in uh, pediatric patients, the even petroleum jelly um, is necessary to prevent damage to the skin. Okay. In 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 addition, you could use uh, antihistamines. Uh, such as, for example, uh, Benadryl 25 to 50 milligrams PO. You could use uh, loratadine um, or uh, claritine. Uh, you could use Certec or Cetizerin. 
uh, 5 to 10 milligrams uh, daily. Um, you have to, of course, avoid precipitant factors. Uh, that's the most important part. Uh, reduction of emotional stress, that's uh, uh, also important for atopic dermatitis. Uh, topical corticosteroids are the main stain of therapy. Creams or ointments applied twice daily are effective for most patients with mild to moderate disease. Emollients are applied between corticosteroids application and can be mixed uh, with them to decrease the corticosteroid amount required to the cover area because remember, corticosteroids, one of the main side effects is uh, atrophia of the skin. So you could use from topical steroids to systemic steroids. Okay, but try to avoid systemic steroids whenever possible because disease often recurs and topical uh, therapy are safer. Remember all the side effects that the corticosteroids have. So lower potency, lower potency uh, steroids is uh, used for the face. The lower the potency, the less risk for uh, atrophia of the skin. You don't want the patient to have a trophy on the face because otherwise you're going to see all the capillaries and, and vessels of the skin and that's the uh, liability legally. Uh, immediate to high potency for the rest of the body and depending on the uh, face of the disease, if it's acute, uh, subacute or chronic. Um, so try to use a short term uh, management with high potency, uh, which is two weeks uh, for adults and one week for children. Um, Creams, remember that the creams are uh, better because the cream has the uh, uh, water base. Um, gels have alcohol base, so you wouldn't want to apply a gel uh, which has alcohol base on a skin that is already irritated and uh, uh, it, could produ it could produce more irritation on top. Oilments, uh are more potent than and creams. So if you have a very high acute face and an angry looking uh, contact dermatitis or eczema, you could start with the ointment and then uh, switch to, to the cream. Uh, but, you know, gels are better for chronic uh, conditions, as I said. Um, if you cover the area with uh, uh, dressings, uh, I will afford the more hydration. The RVC effects are basically uh, based on these medications that are uh, given if you give corticosteroids, even if it's topical. Remember all the side effects that corticosteroids could produce to the uh, skin, which is atrophy uh, and systemic as well as such hyperglycemia, etc., even though it's topical. So uh, prolonged use on the face could produce, again, atrophy and an acne-like uh, uh, pattern. Um, thinning of the skin, shiny of the skin, atrophy, that is a no-no. So on the face, never, never intermediate to high potency uh, steroids and that could be a question for you. And remember that it could potentiate cataract formations and glaucoma as well when you use it for long periods of time. Systemic corticosteroids that try to avoid them is the third line of treatment because of the major side effects. The uh, contraindications uh, of uh, using systemic and topical steroids, remember autoimmune diseases, uh, patients already using that, so you're going to potentiate uh, 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 adverse effects such as osteoporosis and renal insufficiency. Um, it's also contraindicated uh, for patients that uh, have already uh, an immunodeficiency. Uh, such as systemic mycosis. In addition, there are other therapies that could be used which are immunomodulators that are T-cell inhibitors. They are effective for uh, atopic dermatitis when all the treatments uh, uh, do not resolve. So if the patients do not respond to corticosteroids, either topical or uh, systemic, um, then you could use tacrolimus or uh, Pymocrolimus, which is the, an immunomodulator. Uh, oral antihistamine, as I said, to um, avoid pruritus and uh, lichen, lichenification. Um, 
basically, remember this is the, uh, a disease process, uh, mostly atopic dermatitis of pediatric uh, population, but it could be seen in adolescents. So use uh, low potency in the face and uh, for seven days uh, in children, which you don't have to worry about pediatric uh, uh, population, and topical immunosuppressants uh, for age two and older. And remember that could cause atrophy. Complementary therapy is also um, as adjuvant of treatment, which it, it could work. Uh, it's not going to produce any damage, but it's a benefit for the patient. Like Gingo, Gingo biloba that antagonizes platelet aggregation. Uh, the only bad thing is that if it's in the uh, patient that is already taking aspirin for cardiovascular diseases or Plavix because of a stent or CAD, uh, or patient has anticoagulation therapy for any other condition, it could produce uh, more bleeding risk. Zinc uh, and other nutrition uh, factors such as vitamin A and E to um, repair the stratocorneums and uh, uh, basically improve uh, a barrier um, function to avoid uh, transepidermal water loss. Now let's talk about uh, fungal infection. And uh, this is uh, basically what we cover is the candida and tinnitus. And those are dermatophytosis, is D E R, I'm sorry, D E R M A T O P H Y T O S E S. So dermatophytosis. So dermatophytosis are basically fungal infections of uh, keratins in the skin and nails. Uh, nail infection is called tinea, ongius, or onychomycosis. And the symptoms and signs uh, vary by site of infection. Diagnosis is by clinical appearance and um, by examination of skin scraping on potassium hydroxide wet mount. Dermatophytosis are mold that uh, require keratin for nutrition, so basically they uh, uh, feed themselves from the skin and the annexus, which are the nails. Uh, most uh, live on stratocornion, the hair, the nails to survive. Human infections are caused by epidermal fetum, microsporin, and trichophyton. These infections differ from candidiasis in that they're rarely, if ever, invasive. Candidiasis could produce systemic infections, and tinnitus uh, rarely produce that. The transmission is always uh, from person to person, animal to person. So if your pet has a, a, a fungi infection, it could be transmitted to you. Rarely. It could be produced from soil to person. The organism may persist indefinitely. Most people do not develop clinical infection. Uh, those who do may have impaired T-cell responses from an alteration in local defenses, such as trauma or vascular compromise, or it's just because the patient has diabetes, or it's just hereditary, or a patient has HIV. So uh, even though it's, it could be common, you need to have in the back of your mind that this patient could have an immunological disease. So the fungi penetrates the surface layers of the skin, uh, skin, hair, and nails, because they need that to nourish themselves. They, are, uh, they grow in a very moist, uh, warm environment. They have, as I said, a hereditary familiar predisposition of compromised immune system. It doesn't happen to everybody. And uh, I already gave the uh, uh, microorganisms that tend to produce that. Uh, the name is acquired based on the area. If it's that in the uh, scalp, it's called tinea capitis. If it's in the uh, nails, it's ongius. If it's in the body, it's tinea corporis. Um, there's another form that is called versicola, which is another uh, type of fungi infection. The symptoms and signs vary by sight, as I said. Uh, the uh, organism uh, virulence and host susceptible and hypersensitive determine the severity. I mean, it's more severe on the scalp and it's more severe on the ongeal um, than, uh, for example, in, in, in the body. Uh, there's little or no inflammation. Uh, patients could be completely asymptomatic or having mildly itchy uh, lesions with scale, uh, with raised borders that remit and recur, 
Occasionally, there is inflammation, uh, severe, and uh, it could be manifested as vesicular or bullous, uh, usually on the foot, uh, I'm sorry, on the feet, um, but and, as a, and, a, and on the scalp, as I said, but that's, that's very rare. So you have here tinea capitis that you're able to see that there is the areas of uh, uh, boldness that the um, center, the clearance uh, center of the uh, scalp, uh, you don't see it very well in this uh, picture, but there is damage of the hair follicle. The difference between this tinea capitis and alopecia areata, that if you see in the alopecia areata, the uh, center of baldness, uh, there is no hair at all. In the tinea capitis, there is a broken shaft of hair, damaged hair, by the fungi. Here you have uh, tinea pedis, that you see the moisture, the humidity, uh, the damage of the skin by the uh, fungi. The tinea uh, ungio, that is called onychomycosis as well. The crudis, that is loca located in the um, uh, inguinal area. You're able to see that there is the raised uh, borders. Give me one second. Okay, I apologize. So let's continue. This is the tinea corporis. That again is the same dermatophytosis that, that causes pink to red annular uh, patches or plaques with raised uh, scaly borders that span peripherally and tend to have a clear center. Um, this is the if you remember it's called ringworm. Uh, body ringworm uh, is a rare variant uh, form and appears uh, nomular uh, with round shapes so you could have two different forms but the most common is this one with a clear center. Um, if you uh, scrape uh, in the borders you, you will be able to see scales um, and again it's called by uh, the uh, tinea rubrum or canis because it could be trespassed from the, um, you know, animals to, to the human as well. Tinea uh, manus uh, is basically the same, uh, this raised uh, borders of the skin. Tinea versicolor is another variant, it's not called by um, the same uh, type of, of fungi is the, uh, caused by Malassezia furfur, is M-A-L-A-S-S-E-Z-I-A, furfur, F-U-R-F-U-R, that uh, manifests as multiple asymptomatic scaly patches that varies in color. That's the reason why it acquired that name because in Latin, versi color is the versatile or different colors it has the ability to change color from white to tan to brown to pink it's, it's a harmless uh, fungi uh, is a normal component of the skin flora uh, this myelocercia furfur that in some people causes the, the uh, disease process most affected people in this case are healthy uh, they, they don't have uh, an immunocompromised uh, disorder uh, but factors that may predispose to this disease include heat, humidity. If you are on corticosteroid uh, treatment, if you're undernourished, uh, if you're pregnant, if you have diabetes, or any other disorder. Hypopigmentation in tinea versicolor is due to inhibition of tyrosinase, which uh, causes the malassezia furfur to produce uh, acetic acid. Um, the symptoms that I already described, so again it's asymptomatic, uh, appears like tan, brown, salmon, pink, or white scaly patches um, in, in the body. It's very common in the summer uh, time. 
before uh, we go into the uh, diagnosis and treatment, let's talk uh, briefly that uh, I went over quickly through uh, tinea capitis, which you have right here. Again, um, what you have is round patches of dry scale alopecia that um, remember the hair shaft break at the scalp surface. That's the main difference between the um, alopecia areata and uh, the tinea capitis. The uh, pedis we uh, covered briefly um, basically is um, in the interdigital spaces that um, you will be able to see uh, humidity uh, maceration okay we talked about the uh, ongil uh, briefly as well the crudis which uh, again the same uh, you have maceration uh, you have uh, lichenification by scratching and you have the raised borders okay so let's go to the uh, diagnosis and treatment um, basically it's done by a wet mount of uh, potassium hydroxide and uh, what you're able to see is the high um of, of the fungi Okay. You could also do fungal culture or, or uh, wood lamp, but uh, the most common uh, diagnostic evaluation is by potassium hydroxide. You scrape the borders of the fungi, you put it in a microscopic slide, you put uh, two drops of potassium hydroxide and you look in the microscope and you're able to see the high fives. Uh, there are topical uh, treatment for um, uh, tinnias in general, uh, you could use uh, topical allylamides, which are, for example, lamisil or tinactin or mycostatin, which are over the counter. Uh, the other two are per by prescription that you apply twice a day. This this table, I forgot to put this table. This is the, an overview of the medications, but it's basically the uh, dosages. In addition, uh, you could use uh, uh, other um, antifungal choices uh, such as uh, clotrimazole or ketoconazole or itraconazole as well, or lamisil as I mentioned. Uh, Griseofilbin, um, what does is produces fungistatic deposit uh, of the carotene precursors, uh, but it's, it's more for systemic uh, tinnias, for systemic fungi. Uh, remember that the uh, major uh, side effect is that uh, it could produce the uh, aggravation of the lupus er erythematose and it's a cytochrome P450, uh, so increases warfarin levels and other uh, um, anti-seizure medications uh, and oral contraceptives are decreased, so you need to uh, use a second method of contraception with griseofulvin. But again, griseofulvin is, is mainly reserved for systemic uh, conditions. The azoles are the uh, most commonly prescribed, which are ketoconazole, nisoral, itraconazole, spironox, turbinafi, lamisil, or fluconazole, not fluca, fluconazole, diflucan. And remember that for these azoles uh, in pharmacology, you need to monitor renal function and uh, liver function. For the CVC that uh, they tend to, which is rarely, produce thrombocytopenia and also uh, leukopenia. Other um, non-pharmacological treatment that you could use, for example, for the toenails, uh, there is the Penlac. Uh, that's per per by prescription, but without prescription, you could um, um, soak uh, the, fin the, the fingers and the toes in, in vinegar. Uh, or Vicks Vapor Rub, uh, but what has worked for me that is not even on your exam, uh, but as you know, um, a method that maybe 
uh, is not advised but I have done it and it has worked for me is basically Clorox I have I had one time uh, a tinea ongio uh, on my toenails uh, by pedicure uh, you know all the salons that most likely they don't use uh, very good antiseptic methods and uh, I didn't want to take any medication to prevent liver damage or just basically go to the doctor every month to have a liver function test being drawn and I basically cut the nail, the nail, the nail very, very short, and I uh, immersed uh, my toe in, in Clorox and uh, went away completely. Now, um, difference uh, between dermatophytes uh, and Candida. Candida is basically moniliasis, um, most commonly ca caused by Candida albicans. Uh, infections can occur anywhere. Uh, but they're most commonly in skin folds, in digital web spaces, genital, and oral mucosa. The symptoms uh, vary depending on the site um, of appearance, uh, but um, most likely the uh, symptoms are, um, as you could see here, is basically pyritic, uh, erythematous patches with satellite lesions. This is very, very very pathognomonic of candida. If we go back to tinea corporis and even tinea cruris, let's go back a little bit briefly, right here. If you come here into the tinea uh, cruris, you're able to see very well demarcated borders. You don't see any uh, tiny points outside the lesion which is present in candida. Let's continue back to candida. You're able to see this tiny dots, red dots outside, outside the borders, which are called satellite lesions. And that is completely pathognomonic of candida. Now, um, before we go into the treatment, um, Candida is it risk factors or hot weather, uh, restrictive clothing, poor hygiene uh, in the babies, uh, infrequent diapers and um, changes, uh, or any outer flora by antibiotic therapy. If you are on prolonged antibiotic therapy, you could develop this. Inflammatory diseases such as psoriasis uh, could predispose the patient, and of course, immunosuppressions by either you're diabetic, you're pregnant, uh, you are on immunosuppressive drugs, or you have any type of endocrinopathy such as Cushing or hypothyroidism, or any blood dyscrasias that could alter the T cells. There are many types of candida. We cover vulvovaginitis, uh, uh, candidiasis uh, already, but there's candida of the nail. There is uh, also candida of the mucocutaneous uh, oropharynx which um, you could see the uh, the cottage cheese uh, 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 patches on the tongue and the mucosa that if you try to uh, clean them uh, will leave uh, um, a very uh, erythematous and bleeding uh, area. So treatment, uh, again the diagnosis is uh, exactly the same by KOH um, and the treatment is the, uh, clotrimazole, meconazole, fuconazole, or itraconazole. It's exactly the same for uh, astenias, the topical. Um, for tinias, the, besides the topical, you could use the um, greasy of um, but again, it's mostly for systemic condition. Uh, the most common uh, treatment that is used for candida is diflucan. That you could use 100 to 150 milligrams one tablet uh, once only. Um, the rest of the assaults, remember that you need to uh, monitor uh, LFTs and, and renal function and topicals that you could also use. Now let's talk about psoriasis. Psoriasis is an inflammatory disease that manifests uh, most commonly as well circumscribed erythematous papules and plaques covered by silvery scales. That's the key word. OK. 
okay, is the, is an immune mediated disease that has a rapid turnover of epidermal cells. That remember that uh, contact dermatitis atopia uh, or atopic dermatitis that occurs in the flexor surface. This occurs in the extensor surface, so in the knees, in the elbows. Even though it could uh, be present in the whole uh, skin, uh, mostly in the torso, uh, trunk, uh, as uh, psoriasis guttata. The most common triggers include trauma, infection, and um, some drugs. Symptoms are usually minimal, but uh, mild to severe itching uh, may occur. Cosmetic uh, implications may be a major psychological factor. Uh, some people develop severe disease with painful arthritis. The etiology um, has recurrent and uh, exacerbation periods. Um, the definitive cause is unknown. Um, but there are well identified triggers such as injury, uh, which is called a Kobner a phenomenon, uh, wherever you have a patch and uh, or a healthy skin and you suffer a trauma, even a minimal trauma to the skin will uh, produce the papules, the plaque, and then the silvery uh, uh, scales uh, on top of it. So. That's the reason why it appears uh, mostly on the elbows and the knee, because you tend to uh, knee da kneel down or put your elbows uh, uh, on the table to ride down, or so any area that suffers even a minimal uh, trauma uh, will have this flare up. Again, the cause is unclear, but involved the uh, immune stimulation stimulation of the epidermal keratinocytes is mediated by T cells. Um, and certain genes, uh, such as the HLA antigens, are associated with psoriasis. It's also associated with uh, chromosome 6P21. Um, so again, it's the hyperproliferation of keratinocytes by the immune system being altered. It could precipitate, uh, be precipitated by uh, a local streptococci infection, uh, but there are other factors that are associated, such as endocrine imbalance or emotional distress. Let me pause and I'll come. Okay, other factors, uh, uh, for example, beta blockers uh, could induce uh, or precipitate uh, psoriasis, the lithium, uh, ACE inhibitors, the indometacine. Um, aminophiline, emotional stress, alcohol consumption, tobacco abuse, obesity. So if you look at this picture, this is uh, psoriasis guttata, which is more uh, generalized. Uh, there are many subtypes. Um, you're most commonly uh, used to see the uh, plaques that has silvery, silvery looking aspect in the scalp, in the extensor surface, such as elbows and knees, but it could occur in the genitals, in the buttocks, in the nail, in the axilla, in the umbilicals, everywhere. Uh, the disease can be widespread as this uh, picture is showing. Um, but most commonly is uh, uh, presented as the erythematose papules or plaque that are covered with thick silvery shiny scales like this one this is more generalized as well it's kind of blurry but it's, it's guttata with the silvery uh, skin I mean silvery, silvery plaques so again, well circumcised erythematous papules and plaques covered by silvery scales. Okay. Now, uh, treatment uh, most commonly is the um, if you have plaques, you could use the topical steroids, um, emollient, salicylic acid, uh, coal tar, and anthralines, uh, even. 
um, systemic immunosuppressants such as methotrexate and cyclosporine and tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. Um, if you have a psoriasis guttata, which is G-U-T-T-A-T-E, uh, has the abrupt appearance of multiple plaques uh, all over the body, most commonly in the trunk, and uh, tends to be um, uh, induced by streptococci pharyngitis. Besides the uh, treatment for psoriasis, the uh, topical and even uh, immunomodulators, um, you could uh, add antibiotic therapy to cover streptococcal infection because uh, is is the most common etiology that precipitates psoriasis guttata, and this is a dermatological emergency. So again, you could use the potent systemic drugs such as metrotrexate, cyclosporine, and tumor necrosis factor, or intense topical therapy. Uh, such as TAR, antraline, uh, and even phototherapy. And of course, you have to eliminate the uh, triggering factors. Emollients, called TAR, as I said, antraline, and even vitamin D3. D3. You can use the retinoids, such as the Accutane or uh, Retin A, uh, that also helps. Uh, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors such as etanercept or Inflimax and uh, hydroxyurea and ultraviolet light treatment. Now let's talk about uh, pityriasis uh, rosea. Um, pityriasis uh, rosea, oh before, okay. Pityriasis rosea is a self-limiting inflammatory disease character characterized by diffu diffuse uh, scaling papules or plaques. The um, disease process is uh, more common in ages 10 to 35, but it can occur in an elderly population, but it's very, very rare. The cause may be viral infection. Uh, herpes uh, virus is implicated in this disease. Um, what you will see is uh, a hetero patch. This is pathognomonic of the disease. Uh, classically begins with a single primary hetero patch that appears on the trunk or proximal limbs. A general centripetal eruption um, that is rose color uh, with oval papules and plaques follows uh, a week to two weeks later. The lesions uh, have scaly, slightly raised borders uh, like a collaret um, and resembles a ringworm like tinea corporis but it's not uh, uh, when you culture or when you put in a KOH mount it doesn't uh, show hyphas. Um, patient has pruritus uh, that is occasionally severe uh, Papules uh, may uh, dominate with uh, little non-scaling. And again, uh, that rose or fawn color uh, is, is very pathognomonic. Uh, classically, the lesions orient along skin line, giving a Christmas tree distribution uh, form that is also pathognomonic of the disease. Um, Patients could have a prodrome before the rash uh, with malaise, headache, so very general symptoms that are not a pathognomonic of any disease. Um, forgot to put the picture, but I could send that picture to you. Um, the uh, diagnosis uh, is basically clinically when you see that the patient had a, a patch, a solitary patch in the trunk and then multiple uh, patches uh, go come after, like a week after, in a Christmas tree distribution is a very pathognomonic of pityriasia rosea. Um, differential diagnosis, remember the tinea corporis, uh, also drug eruptions and psoriasis, but, um, or even syphilis. Okay, so basically self-limited. Um, most likely doesn't need um, any treatment uh, is related to herpes and remember that hetero patch uh, follow uh, 
uh, an eruption in a Christmas tree distribution. The uh, treatment is basically antipyritic drugs that we already have mentioned, uh, such as Benadryl, Claritine, or Sirtec, and uh, um, erythromycin, because remember that um, you could have superimposed uh, infections uh, associated with staph and, and, and strep, even though the main uh, pathophysiological factor is that related to herpes virus. So the erythromycin is not, is not for herpes, it's for possible superimposed uh, skin infections uh, by strep and, and staph um, due to major pruritus or itching. Now Lyme disease. Lyme disease, you already had it uh, with Professor Morton, so I'm going to cover it uh, quickly. Um, it's a tick transmitted infection. It's basically caused by a spirochet, a borrelia, bordeauxferry. Um, the symptoms are uh, erythema, uh, migraines, rash, which may be followed weeks to months later by a neurological, cardiac, or joint ma manifestations. The um, Lyme disease was the first identified in Connecticut. Um, I don't know if you uh, were aware of that. Uh, it's now the most common uh, reported tick-borne illness in the United States. Um, in Virginia, in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, in Michigan, um, on the West Coast as well, such as in North Carolina and uh, South Carolina, Oregon. Uh, it could occur in Europe as well, and China and Japan. Uh, very, very common uh, in the summer or early fall where people go hunting or uh, people go camping. Uh, most patients are uh, children or young adults um, that live in a heavily wooded area. But, you know, as I said, you could have any age and go hunting or camping and um, uh, you could be exposed to dog ticks or deer ticks um, that could produce the disease. Um, it's transmitted uh, Primarily, again, by this uh, tick, deer tick. Um, the pathophysiology, before we go into the treatment and symptoms, this uh, uh, bacteria, uh, Borrelia, enters the skin at the site of the tick bite, and after uh, a week or up to a month, the organism migrates locally in the skin around the bite, spreads uh, via lymphatic uh, uh, drainage uh, to cause uh, regional adenopathy, or it could disseminate in the blood to organs or other skin sites. Initially, an inflammatory reaction, which is called erythema in migrants, as you could see, um, occurs before significantly due to antibody response to the infection. So there is serological conversion uh, at that time. Um, it has three stages. Uh, I don't know if you were explained like that. Uh, it's an early localized, early disseminated, and late. Um, the early and late are usually uh, separated by uh, an asymptomatic interval, which is the latent phase. So in the early localized, the erythema migrants, uh, which is the hallmark and best clinical indicator of uh, Lyme disease, is the first sign of the disease. Occurs in 75% or more uh, patients, uh, beginning as a red, this is the pathognomonic lesion, like red target, um, is uh, basically red macule or papule at the site of the tick bite usually on the proximal portion of the extremity or the trunk um, and again appears between a week uh, to a month after the tick bite. Uh, because ticks uh, are so small, most patients do not realize that they have been bitten by it. Uh, the area then expands uh, often with a clear uh, center and uh, the and the periphery is red resembling a bull's eye. Darkening erythema may develop in the center, um, which may be hot to touch and indurated. Without therapy, uh, erythema migrants uh, typically fades. Um, patients could um, continue having mucosal uh, lesions. Early disseminated uh, symptoms uh, 
begins weeks after the erythema migrants um, when the bacteria spreads through the body. Soon after onset, uh, nearly in half of the patients, uh, they develop um, secondary skin lesions which are also annular and but without induration center. Uh, patients uh, develop musculoskeletal flu-like symptoms, uh, malaise, fatigue, fever, chills, uh, up to uh, neurological manifestations. Uh, frank arthritis uh, could be present, um, backache, uh, nausea, vomiting, sore throat, and even splenomegaly. Neurological abnormalities that are present, uh, it could uh, be from uh, meningoencephalitis, uh, Bell's palsy, bilateral uh, radiculoneuropathies, um, myocardial as well are present. Uh, patients could have a winky back uh, or third degree or heart blocks, um, myopericarditis, uh, uh, chest pain. In late, um, if untreated Lyme disease, uh, patients develop more arthritis, um, swelling, and large uh, joints such as the knees. Uh, patients uh, could have uh, uh, low-grade fever, uh, which is uh, unremittent. Patients could have uh, cephalopathy, sleep disorders, mood memory disorders. The diagnosis is basically by clinical evaluation and uh, supported by acute and conval conv convalescent uh, serological testing. Um, cultures of blood and relevant body fluids could be done such as the CSF and joint uh, fluids may be obtained primarily to diagnose uh, other pathogens. Uh, you could see acute uh, IgM and uh, convalescent IgG antibody titers two weeks apart may be helpful. Um, you could also use the ELISA test uh, uh, that should be confirmed by Western blood. It's nothing related to HIV. It's for um, uh, Lyme disease. However, uh, remember that seroconversion may be late, which is more than four weeks or occasionally is absent, so if you have suspicions of the disease, you should treat empirically. A positive IgG titer alone represents previous exposure. Uh, if only IgM uh, is detected on Western blood, uh, especially long after exposure, the results are often false positive. So you should go ahead and treat the patient um, um, if you suspect the disease, and of course if you're able to see the uh, erythema migrans, which is pathognomonic. You do PCR uh, testing uh, of CSF or synovial fluid, um, which is often positive uh, when uh, those sites are involved. Um, diagnosis depends on both results uh, of the test and the presence of uh, the typical findings uh, clinically. The erythema migrants strongly suggest Lyme disease, particularly when supported by other elements such as the recent tick bite exposure to an endemic area uh, and also the uh, typical symptoms. The uh, treatment um, should be guided by uh, multiple alternatives that uh, vary uh, with the stage, uh, typically include amoxicillin, uh, doxycycline, and ceftriaxone. Uh, most features of Lyme disease respond to antibiotic, but treatment of early disease is most successful. In the less stage disease, antibiotic eradicate the bacteria, relieving the arthritis in most people. However, a uh, few genetically predisposed people have persistent arthritis, even though the inflammation and the infection uh, went away. You use NSAIDs as well uh, for complete heart block that may require a temporary uh, pacemaker. Uh, for tense knee joints uh, due to effusion requires aspiration. Um, so the guidelines for antibiotic treatment for Lyme's disease for early, for example, you could use amoxicillin, uh, 500 milligrams TID for 14 to 21 day, or doxycycline, 100 milligram uh, PO BID for 21 days, 
or you could use acetromycin 500 milligrams um, PO once um, once a day for 10 days uh, or um, if you have uh, neurological manifestations such as uh, meningitis or Bell's palsy um, you could treat as uh, early uh, or ceftriaxone uh, 2 grams IV once a day for 28 days or uh, cefotaxime uh, 2 grams uh, Q8 hours for 28 days so it's, it's longer the uh, the treatment. Penicillin you could use 3 to 4 million units uh, for 28 days or doxycycline 100 to 200 BID for 28 days um, so again if it's early disease you could go up to 21 days you know 14 to 21 days if it's uh, cardiac or neurological or even arthritic involvement uh, you could use uh, the same dosage as up to 28 days now let's talk about uh, cancers uh, skin cancers um, you know that um, this is related to um, the effect of sunlight in the skin. Um, the skin basically responds to sunlight with chronic uh, actinic keratosis or uh, any type of photosensitivity reaction. So uh, basically the adverse reaction uh, includes uh, from acute sunburn to several chronic changes. Uh, skin thickening, uh, wrinkling, uh, and other uh, lesions up to uh, cancer. Basically what happens is that the exposure of the sun uh, leads to inactivation and loss of epidermal longer harm uh, cells of the skin that is protective uh, by the innate immune system. So the uh, main uh, difference, I mean we're going to cover now the um, different types of uh, skin cancer and uh, we're gonna go from um, from uh, actinic keratosis uh, up to um, melanomas so actinic keratosis is uh, basically um, a precancerous uh, skin cell uh, lesion that um, is pink or red uh, has poorly um, marginated and feels rough and scaly uh, versus uh, seborrheic keratosis which is benign and it's waxy and stock on looking so look at the pictures this is actinic keratosis so it could be from pink to red uh, it has rough scaling palpation so besides this one that is uh, uh, grown if you pass your hand through this skin is is rough versus uh, the cerebral ray keratosis which is brown uh, and has the stock on appearance this is benign this is precancerous main treatment for uh, actinic keratosis you could use uh, topical uh, chemotherapy such as 5-fluoracil or uh, topical imiki mode which is an immunomodulator or you could basically eliminate them one by one by cryotherapy or curatage but which is liquid nitrogen but uh, uh, you could use the one week treatment with uh, Effudex which is 5-fluoracil and uh, try to eliminate them if they don't go away then you could do uh, liquid nitrogen burning the skin um, the cerebral keratosis uh, basically is benign is uh, cosmetic uh, to remove it or not and the main treatment is basically uh, um, curatage now let's talk about squamous cell carcinoma which is the uh, cancer of, of the skin is basically uh, a malignant tumor of the epidermal keratinocytes that invades the dermis uh, it's usually uh, in sun exposed uh, area 
uh, it could arise from uh, an actinic an actinic keratosis uh, produces local destruction that may be extensive and metastases uh, it could occur in advanced stages uh, signs and symptoms uh, the clinical appearance uh, could vary you could see it here as an example uh, a non-healing lesion on sun exposed so, on sun exposed uh, surface areas uh, should raise the suspicious of, of skin cancer and mostly squamous or carcinoma. The tumor could arise from a red papule plaque uh, with crusted surface and uh, nodule or nodule center uh, that has uh, a crater, a, an ulcerated center. But sometimes could be seen as a warty uh, surface looking. So you could see here like a crack crater so it produces local destruction that could be extensive diagnosis is by biopsy and the treatment is by surgical excision or MOS. Uh, MOS is a procedure that um, basically uh, the uh, lesion is removed and is taken to the microscope and uh, uh, the borders of the lesions are analyzed uh, for two centimeters uh, benign uh, healthy skin margins so up to the time that the uh, a healthy skin is not seen in the microscope the patient remains in the uh, clinic uh, you could continue uh, excising uh, or increasing the size of the uh, surgical excision up to you are able to see two centimeters of healthy skin in a microscope. Otherwise, um, if it's not done by most procedure, which is the most effective, you basically do a surgical excision, you send the patient home, uh, and you send the specimen uh, to pathology, to the laboratory to analyze, but that could take up to a week or two, and the patient has to return. So the most procedure has the, the greatest benefit. Then uh, there is the basal cell carcinoma, which um, is the more superficial, uh, slow-growing papular nodule that um, comes from the epidermis. Uh, they arise from the keratinocytes uh, near to the basal layer. Um, it's not as deep as the uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Metastasis is rare which is very common in squamous cell carcinoma, but local growth by uh, deepening uh, locally, you know, they basically penetrate locally in the skin, uh, pr could produce highly destruction of the surrounding tissue, but not metastases. Diagnosis is the same. Uh, the symptoms, uh, the main uh, manifestation, the most common is the, in the nose, in the face, in the ear lobes. Uh, by a small, shiny, translucent pink nodule with telangiectasias. This is telangiectasias, which is the spider vein, in the center of the nodule, which is pearly gray, uh, is shiny, is the, or pink. It could be ulcerated. It could be indurated. It could have uh, uh, ulcerated border as a borders as or center as the uh, squamous cell carcinoma, but it's it's, it's not the most common uh, presentation. The most common is that tiny papules that enlarges slowly uh, over the months or years, and has prominent engorged vessels, which are telangiectasias, uh, in the center. And the treatment uh, is basically a shave or punch biopsy with surgical excision. But you could also use the uh, Effudex, which is the 5 fluoracil if you have more. Of course, if it's only one, uh, there's no need to use that. Now let's uh, talk about the last topic, which uh, is malignant uh, melanoma. Um, malignant melanoma arises from melanocytes, which is a pigmented area in the skin. Um, Mucosal membranes, eye, and even uh, could metastasize to the uh, central nervous system. Metastasis is correlated with depths of dermal invasion. Uh, with spread, prognosis is very poor. Um, the cases of melanoma are growing in the United States, so this is a topic of highly um, 
questions in boards. Uh, melanomas uh, occurs mainly in the skin but also in the mucosa so don't be fooled the patients that have family history of melanoma they should have a yearly screening of the whole skin including mucosa of the oral and genital and rectal area it could be even present in the conjunctiva which is very uh, rare uh, but um, there are reported cases of uh, uh, melanoma in the choroid layer of the eye and even in the arachnoid matter. Uh, melanomas vary in size, uh, shape, and color, but it's usually uh, pigmented. Um, local metastasis uh, results uh, uh, from satellite papules and nodules um, and goes from the skin to the internal organs. The etiology is the, usually um, in sun exposed area by repeated blistering sunburns, so be careful with uh, your beaches and uh, your tanning. Uh, no melanoma skin cancers uh, uh, could uh, increase the risk. Family and personal history. If your first skin, if you if you have freckles, uh, atypical moles, uh, particularly uh, more than ten. Uh, if you have immunosuppression, uh, if you have. Uh, um, familial atypical uh, mole syndrome uh, you should be screened every year. Uh, patients with uh, personal history of melanoma have an increased and additional uh, uh, history so can emphasize more about this. Um, so how do you uh, screen patients for uh, melanoma? Basically there is the, uh, classification that uh, you should know uh, besides the A, B, C, D, E, uh, there is superficial spreading melanoma, there is nodular melanoma, lentigo malignant, um, and even acromelanoma. But uh, diagnosis uh, is basically uh, done by this uh, staging uh, or classification. Um, a for asymmetry. Uh, so if you're if you're imaginarily fold the uh, mold in half, uh, both uh, faces of the mold should be symmetric. The borders, if they are irregular, not round or oval, um, it could raise suspicious. The color, if there is color variation within the mold, uh, that also uh, raises suspicious. If the diameter is more than six millimeters, or if the um, evolution of the mole, if it's a new mole in a patient more than 30 years of age, or if there is a changing mole, um, also should raise that suspicious. Um, the uh, treatment, so again, this is asymmetric. You see, if you fold this uh, mold in half, this area here doesn't have this black spot. So maybe if this black spot were not present and imaginarily you fold this more than half could be symmetric, but having this area here is not symmetric at all. The same with this one. If you fold this in half, this area is not symmetric with the rest. Diameter more than six millimeters. The treatment before we end is basically surgical excision. Uh, possible adjuvant uh, radiation therapy. Remember, this is the uh, highly metastatic and highly uh, mortality. So you have to be aggressive. Uh, cryotherapy for metastatic or unresectable melanoma, uh, immunotherapy, um, and radiation as well. So treatment of melanoma is primarily surgical excision with wide local excision. chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, and again if there is metastasis you could use uh, immunotherapy with uh, anti-program death uh, PD-1 antibodies which are pendrolizumab. But what you have asked in boards is basically the ABCDE. Uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, is indicated and uh, immunotherapy as well for advanced stages which is the, basically the infusion of uh, activated killers uh, or antibodies. And this is the end of this presentation.